Hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I'm a Staten Island historian and author, and I'm here at the Noble Collection today to talk about two very interesting little islands off the shore of Staten Island. Uh, they're off of South Beach, or you may have noticed them when you were driving across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. They're off to the right. Of course, if you're driving, don't look for them. Okay, but it all started back in 1799. There was a quarantine station located in Tompkinsville. By today's map, it would have been the New York shoreline up along a Hyatt, um, Hyatt Street to about St. Mark's Place and going south almost to Victory Boulevard. There was a quarantine station there. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, that's St. George. But it did not become St. George until 1886. And we're back in the early 1800s right now. So the quarantine station was a place where immigrants were sequestered if it was believed that they might have contagious illnesses. Um, and, and, and it wasn't unusual for them to come into the New York Harbor sick. In fact, a large number of these immigrants, as many as a quarter of uh, the population of uh, traveling immigrants, died en route from infectious diseases. S many of them, most of them, were buried at sea. In any event, event, when the arriving ill were examined by a physician out on the ship, very often when the physicians examined the immigrants out on their ships, they might notice that they, 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 they might have such diseases as yellow fever, smallpox, tuberculosis, uh, measles, diphtheria, and any uh, a suspicion that someone might have a disease like that would land them in the quarantine at Tompkinsville. Um, and oftentimes these diseases spread from the quarantine station into the surrounding communities. Uh, people in these communities of Tompkinsville and New Brighton oftentimes worked at the quarantine. When they left, they might have been, uh, might have caught one of these infectious diseases. So they would spread it to their family, their friends, their neighbors. Very often too, the immigrants who were being held at the quarantine station would so jump the walls and they would escape into the community. I mean, who, after paying uh, money to cross the Atlantic Ocean and who, someone who got stopped at a quarantine station wouldn't want to escape because they always had the fear that they were going to be sent back. Well, the diseases kept spreading into the local community. So the local residents were not one bit happy. For instance, in 1848, remember, this is the time of the, of the great hunger in Ireland. We're seeing thousands and thousands of Irishmen coming to the new world to escape famine that is plaguing the country. Well, in 1848, 180 men, women, and children were afflicted with contagious illnesses in Tompkinsville and New Brighton, and they placed the blame squarely on the quarantine station. Um, and as I said, they were not happy about it. I mean, who would be? They petitioned the state of New York to move the quarantine station. So the state uh, re requested that the people of Coney Island take the quarantine station. Of course, the people of Coney Island said no. They requested that the people in Sandy Hook, New Jersey, accept the quarantine station. Of course, the people at Sandy Hook said no. So they decided eventually that they would set up a quarantine station at what we now call Prince's Bay. And um, the people in Prince's Bay were not at all happy about it. In fact, they were so unhappy with that situation that they decided to set what had been built at this quarantine station in Prince's Bay 
on fire. And this was in um, 1857. They weren't happy with the results of the fire, so they set it on fire once again. And they destroyed everything except maybe a pier and a privy or something like that, so they couldn't put the quarantine station there. Well, the people in Tompkinsville decided that they too, they would set the quarantine station on fire. So on September 1st, 1858, the people of Tompkinsville attacked the, the, the quarantine station. Supposedly there were only a couple of uh, sick people in the quarantine station at this time. And supposedly they bundled them up in nice warm clothing, put them up on a hill so that they could view the, the, the conflagration that they were about to start. And, and they started it. But they too were not happy with the results of their fire, the fire that they set. So they came back the following night on September 2nd, 1858, and they set a fire once again. And this time they did a pretty good job. The state tried to um, keep the sick immigrants in, in the, what remained at the site, but it really wasn't working out very well. So they set up floating hospital ships right, right by the, um, the quarantine station. And in fact, uh, to give you a great idea uh, of where the quarantine station was, if you're familiar with uh, the National Lighthouse Museum, that's where they would dock the ships that were coming into the quarantine station. So here we have now the fact that um, they're on this floating hospital ships off Tompkinsville. The, the quarantine at Princess Bay has been ruined. The quarantine at Tompkinsville has been ruined. Now, they couldn't keep the um, sick people on these ships forever, so they decided, well, there's two wonderful sandbars off the shore of South Beach on Staten Staten Island. So they decided that they would build up the sandbars and they would create two islands that would be used for quarantine purposes. In fact, this time they decided that they would put a crematorium on one of the islands. Now, I bring this up because burial had always been a big problem for the quarantine station at Tompkinsville. They actually had a few cemeteries on their site. In fact, if you recall, um, the site where the new Supreme Court building is located. If you remember, some archaeologists did a study there and they found the remains of immigrants from the time of the Irish hunger and from the time of German immigration in the 1850s. There was also a cemetery established out in Princess Bay. And in fact, there were reports going up to the 1960s, that after a big nor'easter, bones were surfacing on the shoreline at what is now Wolf's Pond Park. But I'm off my subject, as always, <laughs> talking about cemeteries. In any event, they established a crematorium on what would be called Swinburne Island. And for those individuals who did not want their families cremated, there was a cemetery also on the island. Because as you can imagine, um, uh, dying people was a big problem for the quarantine, what to do with the bodies. So that actually solved a big mystery because no, we thought there was a cemetery on Swinburne Island and we finally have gotten it down pat and gotten proof that there was a cemetery on Swinburne Island. In any event, it was finally completed, the sandbars, the buildings, the, the piers, and, and all, everything that they needed for the quarantine station was finally installed by, we believe, 1873. So sick patients began arriving at Swinburne Island in that year. When it first opened, Swinburne Island was referred to as Dick's or Hospital Island. Sometimes it was called the West Bank. Eventually it would be named after a Dr. John Swinburne, 
who had made dramatic discoveries in healing broken bones and fixing dislocated joints. He made these discoveries during the Civil War, so he was a very important man. Eventually, he became a New York State health officer. So Swinburne, while he was a health officer, was also credited with uh, preventing a plague from spreading to around New York City. Hoffman Island, meanwhile, was to be used for people who were suspected of having infectious diseases. And if you were put on, on Hoffman Island, you, uh, if your disease developed, you were quickly switched over to Swinburne Island where the confirmed sick were, were kept. It really must have been a very tedious process, a very fearful process for anybody to be on either of these islands in terms of uh, the, the sickness and, and catching these illnesses and these diseases. Um, I, I can't imagine what have the fear that they must have felt. Okay, so by 1879, the buildings on Hoffman Island are, can hold up to 608 patients. The most common disease at this time is yellow fever. Hoffman Island was about two acres. It would eventually be expanded to over four acres. And by 1892, 850 sick people could be accommodated. There were four brick buildings on the little island and two served as dormitories. Hoffman Island is named after John T. Hoffman. Hoffman was a New York City mayor from 1866 to 1869. He went on to serve as governor of the state of New York from 1869 to 1872. Um, we see the quarantine islands and the quarantine that was at Tompkinsville getting a tremendous amount of press coverage it, all throughout the 1800s, mainly because most people thought that place was a nuisance. Well, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper in 1889 did a series of eight drawings about Hoffman and Swinburne Islands, and it told us a lot about the islands. It showed us the crematorium, it showed us the dormitories, it showed us where the passengers were being ferried back and forth from the islands, and, and they showed us also how the islands were scoured scoured to kill these diseases and the, these viruses and any other illnesses that might be around. Um, there was a Dr. William M. Smith who was the health officer around 1889 and his feeling was that every trace of disease had to be removed from the island. And in order to accomplish this, he declared that the islands had to all be asphalt. There could be no dirt, there could be no grass, nothing like that. It was easier to clean asphalt than it was to clean dirt or gardens or anything like that. By 1892, the quarantine boarding station is located on the Clifton shoreline. All vessels coming into the New York Harbor were required to stop opposite the station for inspection. Inspection of passengers took place during the daylight so that the physician could see their closely and clearly their eyes, their throats, their skin to see if there was any, any chance that they might be infected with a disease. When an epidemic was occurring, infected vessels were expected to stop two miles south of Swinburne Island. They weren't even supposed to come near Swinburne, Hoffman, or Staten Island. When a contagious disease was found, the steamship company that owned the ship was notified, as was the United States Secretary of State. Right up to Washington we'd go with this. So that he could instruct consuls in the United States so that they could inform the necessary inspectors in their own countries. In other words, they were trying to stop the disease where it was in the world before it came to the United States. Health officers in 1892 were watching for the spread of cholera. It had been found in Russia. It soon spread to Finland and France. On August 26th, health officer Jenkins ordered that passengers arriving in New York from infected ports 
and lo or localities. Those ships that had steerage passengers, they were the passengers who were generally kept in the bottom of the ship who, who paid the least for their passage, they were to be su subjected to quarantine detention for three to five days. This is whether they were suspected of having a disease or not. This was done just to keep them on the ship and away from everybody else. Jenkins ordered that all passengers eventually should be brought to Hoffman Island where they would each be given a bath. Also at Hoffman Island, when they were there, their clothes and their baggage would be steamed. And in this way, the clothes and the baggage were disinfected. Passengers would be returned to the ship if suspicious symptoms did not surface. If cholera was found on a steamer, all individuals would be held on the ship for seven days. Eventually, the sick would be removed to a hospital, the baggage and the vessels would be steamed, and all parts of the vessel would also be steamed or disinfected with a solution of bichloride of mercury. The feared cholera arrived. On August 30th, 1892, the steamship Moravia came into the, tried to come into the harbor. Uh, the dreaded news came out though that 833 steerage passengers, 70 crew members had come down with cholera while at sea. 22 of those individuals had already died. A later case developed and that person died as well. The Moravia was ordered to anchor in the lower quarantine, which is also the lower New York Harbor, and it was forced to stay there until September 23rd. That day, the passengers were released. But before the Moravia was released, two other ships arrived during the early hours of September 3rd. They were the Normania and the Rugia. The Normania had 1,300 plus people on board. Some of the passengers had died from cholera en route to America. According to Dr. Jenkins, in the history of the quarantine station, there had never been a case of cholera among cabin passengers coming into the port of New York. It's very unusual. So what they're saying is only the steerage passengers had cholera. And this was really an assumption on their part. The cabin passengers in this case were sequestered on the Normania, and they were not happy about it. They demanded that they be removed to a hotel on Fire Island. So they boarded a ship called the Cepheus that took them to Fire Island, but they were very surprised to find an armed mob on the shoreline ready to fight with them and send them back on the boat. Nobody left the Cepheus. They all stayed on board that ship just opposite Fire Island until things settled down. Hoffman Island, meanwhile, at this time was so crowded, some of the well passengers who needed quarantine or observation were actually sent to Camp Low at Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Meanwhile, a passenger on the Ruggia named Moreno came down with and died from the cholera. According to sources, his body was, quote, quickly wrapped in a sheet soaked in solution of bichloride of mercury, and he was buried in quicklime. That was in order to kill the cholera. The morning of September 7th arrived and a ship called the Wyoming arrived with 808 passengers. It came from Liverpool, a port that actually had had no cases of cholera. All were well, but two days later it was discovered that there were two dead children and one person sick with cholera. There were also three passengers who were suspected of having cholera. Another ship, the Scandia, arrived from Hamburg on September 9th. The doctor who boarded boarded the ship for inspection, was told that there had been 56 cases of cholera and that 32 of these people had died during passage. Upon its arrival, the ship still had two dead bodies, 
12 people suspected of having cholera and nine people who were sick with cholera. There was also an epidemic of measles on the ship. Two more ships arrived. The passengers on that ship, many of them were sick with cholera. And again, there was another epidemic of measles on the ship. In 1892, it was decided that individuals who did not have evidence of being inoculated or vaccinated, a word we're very familiar with, who are not vaccinated against smallpox and who perhaps have been exposed to smallpox would be detained at the quarantine for vaccination. And they would be detained until the vaccine took effect. I'm sure they weren't happy about that. And I'm sure they weren't happy either in December 1902 when a ship called the Saxon Prince arrived with bubonic plague. Two cooks and a steward were stricken after the ship had stopped in South Africa. Dr. Doty, the new health officer, was confident that the disease would not spread though, as officials had prepared for its arrival after reports had been received from South Africa. In 1912, 71.5% of the immigrants coming to the U.S. would pass through the Narrows. The Great War, World War I, would affect the quarantine islands as the number of immigrants dramatically decreased, while the number of incoming freighters from friendly nations increased. So the health officers went from uh, looking at the the immigrants to really looking at the crews of ships that were coming in from friendly nations. Um, of course, uh, the boats of the belligerents were otherwise occupied in 1915. And in addition, many of the German ships that were in the United States at the time war broke out were held in the United States. There were many ships off Manhattan that were held during World War I. Prior to um, World War I, the majority of immigrants coming to the United States were from Italy. But when Italy became involved on the, on, the, uh, on the side of the Germans in World War II, we see an increase of, of Greek and Balkan immigrants coming into the United States. So the quarantine immigrants were actually dealing with typhus among the immigrants around 1915 when cholera returned. There was an epidemic occurring in Europe owing to the war. Officials were bracing for the conclusion of the war because they believed the end of hostilities would bring vast numbers of immigrants who wanted to come to the United States. And it was believed that the ordeals of war would have greatly affected them. I mean, there was you know, starvation, they were uh, unhealthy from having wars going, and the, the mental anxiety of being exposed to, to warfare, they realized would take a toll on many of the immigrants. Hoffman and Swinburne Islands would be used to sequester arriving passengers and immigrants through the 1920s. By the early 1930s, immigrants were no longer being held at Hoffman and Swinburne Islands. During the 1930s, the two little islands were used to quarantine imported wildlife that might have communicable diseases, especially parrots. Parrots were really watched closely at that time for some reason. In 1937, Hoffman Island was inhabited by 800 inner city youth for fun, for picnics, um, but it didn't last long. It had been encouraged by Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, but when Parks Commissioner uh, Robert Moses found out that the kids were you know, on these little islands. He said that they were absolutely undesirable for such a program for youngsters. He said having them there created tenement-like conditions. In 1940, 100 WPA workers were very busy. They were laboring to transform Swinburne Island into an annex for the U.S. Maritime Commission Training School. Um, it was operating also on Hoffman Island. They were eliminating 
taking down five buildings while three buildings were being renovated. The project was expected to last for about five months and was expected to bring the long abandoned docks in the lower harbor back to life. In 1944, we see that Hoffman Island is, is home to a radio operator's training school. But two years later, the school started to fade out. They were valued at $5 million, the islands, but really nobody wanted them. In 1948, um, Swinburne and Hoffman Islands were referred to as former training bases for merchant seamen that had been deserted by the Public Buildings Administration, owing to the cost of their upkeep. Hoffman Island and Swinburne Island were considered to be white elephants. Both were called ghostly islands, unwanted by any government agency. The Navy, the Coast Guard, the U.S. Public Health Service all declined offers to utilize the two islands, owing to the cost of transporting goods, personnel, and equipment. Even into the early 1950s, they still sat unused, although somebody floated a plan to like join them together with landfill and create one big island that would serve as an airport. That didn't work out, obviously. We finally find out that a man by the name of Bernard Baruch had purchased the islands and given them to the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. He had purchased them for only $10,000. New York City real estate for $10,000. In 1965, Mayor Wagner announced that the new park that was going to be on the islands would be named after Baruch. Um, all kinds of ideas were floated for these islands, but nothing ever came to be. Finally, a man by the name of Howard Cleves, who had been long associated with the Staten Island Museum and was a very well-known ornithologist, visited the island. And in that year, in 1964, he found a colony of breeding heron gulls. He counted 105 nests on the island. He determined that this activity had been going on for a long time because the islands had been abandoned. It soon spread the colony to Hoffman Island. Cleves also let everybody know that in 1958, he had gone over to the islands and he found the, the nests of greater black-backed gulls. And the, 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 the gulls, they kept reproducing on the island. In fact, two scientists were over there in 1973 and they found 10 nesting pair of greater black-backed gulls and herring gulls were also continuing to nest on the islands. May 22, 1978, Bill and Norba Siebenheller, naturalist from the Staten Island Museum and also a Staten Island Advance columnist, arrive at Hoffman Island with a naturalist from Gateway National Recreation Area. By this time, the islands have been put into Gateway National Recreation Area. You know, the, the entity that includes um, Great Kills Park and Sandy Hook and such. They found all kinds of nests from the herring gulls and the great black-backed gulls, and they were very excited about it. But one thing that they were really excited about was the fact that they found all these little balls all over the island. They found all kinds of tennis balls, rubber balls, wiffle balls, Spalding balls, all over the island. The balls had to be all larger than three inches across. And they couldn't find, when they went to research it, what the heck were these balls doing on the island? And they finally realized that the gulls must have thought they were eggs from other species of birds. They had carried them and they were dropping them on the asphalts of the island to break them open because gulls do do that. And, and then they eat the contents. But they had a rude surprise when the balls hit the islands and they didn't break open because they were man-made. And of course, they didn't carry anything like that. 
In 2011, we see another Staten Island Advance article from Catherine Carson, and informs us that there are not only herring gulls and black back gulls nesting on the islands, but now, get this, there's great egrets, there's snowy egrets, there's yellow crowned night herons, black crowned night herons, little blue heron and glassy ibis all over the island. And four years later, the most exciting news of all in 2015, the New York City Police Department were out the islands for some reason and they found seals basking on the rocks of the island. Seals were back in the New York Harbor. It was great news. Now, it, it's worth pointing out, I think, that when you go back to 1799, the start of the um, quarantine and the quarantine stations, including Hoffman and Swinburne Islands, you start thinking about the infectious diseases, the care of those who were afflicted with these diseases, the medicines that were discovered, the techniques that were discovered for treating people, and how they learned how to sanitize the islands and the ships and the people. And it really correlates to the COVID epidemic that we've been experiencing in these last few years. And I'd like to just put it out there how brave these people were that they would get on, that weren't put there, you know, because they were suspected of being sick or because they were sick. But these people, like, like the nurses and the doctors today who go into, you know, take care of COVID patients and who have not, um, who do it even though they might catch COVID. So I, I think there's a lot that can be said about the quarantine station, both the, you know, in the past and how it correlates to today. So thanks very much. And I encourage you all to go to noblemaritime.org backslash now, N-O-W, where you'll see a variety of videos about Staten Island history, about maritime activities, all kinds of interesting things for you to watch. Take care.